attempting to speak? Are those our guest speakers today? Um, you can definitely unmute Melissa, please. I don't know Michael, but you're welcome to, to join. So um, I'd like to get started right now so we can keep an eye on time and be respectful of everyone's time. We've got uh, one hour scheduled for this presentation, and hopefully we can keep it uh, just to that. So uh, thank you all for joining our PEP revised third edition highlights webinar. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, first, uh, I'd like to let everyone know that we will be recording the webinar. So it will be available for uh, you all later, as well as anyone else who was not able to join us. In addition to the recording, we can also make the uh, slide presentation available to you. Um, because of the size of the group today, all of your lines will be muted so that we can try and keep this as orderly as possible. Um, we'd like to build in some time for questions at the end, so we can go ahead and unmute the lines or you can feel free to um, pose questions to the host uh, throughout the chat function. You can do that throughout the presentation or at the conclusion and we'd be happy to take your questions. Um, or after the fact, um, you can send an email to the meeting organizer and we can follow up uh, and answer your questions. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have two great presenters, um, beginning with Dr. Susan Fuchs, who's the co-editor um, of the revised third edition of PEP. She's also an associate director of the Division of Emergency Medicine at the Ann and Robert Laurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and a professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And we're also joined uh, by Keith Whitmire, who is a nationally registered paramedic and member of the PEP Steering Committee and an EMS education specialist at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Um, very fortunate to have you both present, and thanks for um, being available to speak with us today. Without further ado, um, Dr. Fuchs, I can pass it over to you and, and kick us off, please. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today as well. Um, we're very excited about the new PEP revised third edition. So we definitely wanted to let you know, you know, what we did and, and different things and also uh, other future things. I'll give you a brief overview of what we're going to discuss and then we will continue. So once again, we'll talk about what we change and revise in the third edition updates. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the 2015 American Heart Association CPR and Emergency Cardiovascular Care Guidelines because they changed a few things, so we want to be up to date. Um, there's also been a group, it's called the Pediatric Life Support Collaborative, and we've been working through uh, many organizations um, in terms of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We'll get to all, all the group. Um, but a lot of the NAEMP, Emergency Nurses Association, American College of Emergency Physicians. And we've tried to make it so that everybody is on the same page, that when you're taking a course that we're all speaking the same language, and we'll get more into that. Um, we also want to update people on course format options, how many hours of continuing education credit you'll get, uh, required course materials, the course completion requirements, registration process, course coordinator teaching requirements, uh, helpful resources, and kind of the future of, and what's ahead for PEP. Uh, next, Brian. Okay. A couple things first with the third edition updates. Um, once again, we did incorporate the new 2015 American Heart Association uh, guidelines. There were a few changes in the pediatric life support, uh, changes in advanced pediatric life support as well as the neonatal resuscitation program. Uh, so we actually did uh, do some updates on that. Um, also, there were some online modules uh, that we're going to talk about and we're revising. Also, some updates um, to the instructor toolkit. Um, like I said, we will be kind of working on that. It, that will be for the course coordinators. Um, and in terms of so people sort of know we're updating files, and then we will let the course coordinators know at, on the website. Uh, once again, we'll go through a couple of things. There's a new, whenever you purchase a textbook, you'll actually get uh, a free electronic book with that. For those who want to teach PEP in Spanish, there's now a new textbook available. And like I said, we, we do want to also let people know we have some supplemental resources. There's the, the website, Facebook page, so lots of other things to continue to, to chat on. Uh, next. Okay. Um, once again, in terms of the new 
2015 American Heart Association CPR and ECC guideline highlights. Uh, they have revised a little bit about the BLS healthcare provider algorithms, both single and two or more rescuers. Not, they have not changed anything. It's still, uh, you know, compressions first, but there are a couple little changes in the actual algorithm. Uh, in terms of in pediatrics, they, in the prior versions, they had taken out lidocaine. It's back in, so lidocaine was added. Um, or amiodarone for resistant V-fib and pulses VTAC in, in pediatrics. There is a new uh, NRP algorithm, and uh, there's definitely updated management of infants born with meconium. So that's probably one of the biggest changes that you'll see. Um, so we did definitely in the newborn chapter wanted to make sure that we were updated with those changes. Uh, next. Other things just in the book just to, to tell you about. There's been a couple terminology changes. Uh, as much we used to call it sudden infant death, now it's actually called sudden unexpected infant death. Uh, so that's a little bit, it encompasses what we used to terminology of, you know, sort of SIDS, now it's SUID. Um, but in the death of a child chapter, we have updated information about causes in that. We've added subcutaneous injection procedure. Um, we obviously updated the cardiopulmonary resuscitation procedure uh, based on new changes. And we've tried to use the term spinal motion restriction versus spinal stabilization. We understand that that's, you know, undergoing lots of changes all through the U.S. Um, and people are sort of in the midst of different things. But I think the term spinal motion restriction is, is the new terminology. So we wanted to definitely incorporate that. We still do have a spinal motion restriction uh, procedure, because I don't think it's gone, but uh, at least in terms of people are definitely adapting things. Next. Okay, just giving you a little background about the Pediatric Life Support Collaborative. Like I said, we, we've had a number of uh, conference calls, phone calls uh, from all of these different organizations. As I mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Emergency Physicians, the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, those are the people who do the HLS course. Um, the American Heart Association, obviously, which is a, a big factor. The Emergency Medical Services for Children, uh, Emergency Nurses Association, the National Association of EMS Educators, National Association of EMS Physicians, uh, National Association of EMTs. So we, we really work together to try and make sure that when you take a course, whether it's PEP, whether it's PALS, whether it's EPC, um, whether it's HLS, that we're all talking the same language because it's been very confusing for people when one uses one terminology and one course uses another terminology. Next. So, so things like just sort of using the same approach across the board. Obviously, pediatric assessment is a, a big factor and that everyone has agreed that the pediatric assessment triangle really does form a general impression. And then we've terminal the terminology we've used is primary assessment, and that includes you know, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Then we've used the term secondary assessment, that includes the focus history, exam, ongoing reassessment, and there is also the uh, sample mnemonic. And then sort of the third part is the diagnostic assessment, and that's you know in a sense from the standpoint of EMS, there are certain things that you can do from a diagnostic assessment, even in the ambulance, whether it's a, a blood sugar, whether uh, it's an EKG, that, not necessarily in kids that you transmit them, but you could do that. Um, but there's certain things that then in the emergency department, such as a chest x-ray, other labs are done. But we really want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Next. There's also a couple of things that we all noticed as we were going through this uh, process that, you know, what is hypoxemia? One person would declare it. You know, under 94, one would be equal or, uh, or less than 94. So we've all kind of come across the terminology that we like um, in terms of hypoxemia, traumatic brain injury, uh, concussion, um, in terms of what is a concussion. I mentioned already spinal motion restriction, status epilepticus, and that's specifically more in terms of the time frame um, about what is status. That's changed over the course of years from in, in essence, you know, 30 minutes to 15 minutes to five minutes from the EMS standpoint. And then the other key is hyperventilation. Uh, we understand that when you have, you know, traumatic brain injury, 
in some cases you might need to do that, but the key thing about that is you have to be able to monitor end tidal CO2 or, or PCO2 to make sure you're not doing too much hyperventilation and keeping the, the numbers uh, reasonable at about 35. Next. Okay. A couple other things. So in terms of those are sort of the some of the big overviews that you will see, not just in PEP, but in some of the other courses, like I said, in terms of terminology, in terms of uh, you know, using the PAT. Other things that we're going to do in terms of we've had this course format options for a little bit of time, but we know it's caused some confusion. So the other thing is that we just want to make sure that not just the students but the PEP coordinators understand this. Um, we understand that, you know, now it's really hard to provide, you know, sometimes one day of on site education, some days two for the ALS course two days, so that we've developed a hybrid course. And this makes it easier that you can do a lot of the online learning at home or uh, on your spare time, and then actually then you come on site for the scenarios and hands-on skill station. So that's really the hybrid course, and we're going to get into exactly hours and other things. The on-site course obviously is for people who prefer to learn by attending a traditional instructor-led classroom course. This does include the case-based lectures, the videos that still exist in, in PEP, as well as small group scenarios and the hands-on skill stations. Next. Um, one really key factor is the American Academy of Pediatrics is an accredited provider of CSBEAMS credit, which is the Continu Continuing Education Coordinating Board for Emergency Medical Services. And so participants who successfully complete the PEP course are eligible to receive Con Ed credits. Um, you must select the option to receive the credits during the access code redemption process, so that's really important. And then the CSPEAM certificates will be delivered electronically. So the key thing is when you, and we'll talk about access codes in a second, but when you actually select which, whether you're going to take a hybrid course or on-site, that you select that you want the CEUs because it does change based on the courses. Next. This gives you an idea that there is some difference. Um, when you're on site, you actually have 9.25 hour course, but it's eight hours of education um, in classroom. This is the BLS course, and you get eight hours of credit. When you do the hybrid course, it's actually you're doing nine online modules um, at home, and then you have a four hour on site course for the hands on skill station instructor credits. So it winds up being an 8.75 hour course with 8.5 hours of education, and therefore you get 8.5 hours of credit. So you do get half credit extra for doing the hybrid course, but once again, you do have to complete the online modules uh, before you attend the four-hour on-site course. Next. For the ALS course, um, it's a six, is it, remember, it's a two-day course, so when you look at that and you say, why are the hours more than the credits? Um, because we do need to give you some breaks in between and some lunch time. But, so it is a 16.75 hour course with 14 hours of education. Once again, two days usually in the classroom and you get 14 C-SPEAM hours. For the hybrid course, once again, it is a 14 hour course with 12.5 hours of education because you do need to attend an eight hour on-site course. Uh, and that's once again following completion of non, nine online modules. So you get six hours of credit for that. Um, so your total credit hours is 12.5 uh, CSPEAM credits. Next. Okay, a couple of things just in terms of required course materials. Um, we do want one PEP instructor toolkit per course coordinator. So once again, so the course coordinator has the information that they need. When you do this, the one PEP revised third edition textbook. Now, once again, this includes an access code and the ebook for a student to be reviewed prior to the course. So we would, you know, the, the preference is that you do just do some reading before you attend the course. And then when you actually have the book, you'll see that there's one access code per student. Uh, codes are located in front of the cover of the book. Um, and then they, once you access them and once you um, redeem them, it's good for one year. Yes, you can purchase some codes separately, um, but like I said, so if you are going to do some librarying of the books, every student needs their own access code. 
uh, and that's really the key is access codes required for each student. And like I said, you can't use the same access code for two students. You can use, ideally, you can have one book, but they each have to be able to access uh, either the, the book, the e-materials, and other things so that they can register and then get their credits. Uh, in terms of how course materials can be purchased, it's through the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, the number and website is listed. Uh, and Jones and Bartlett Learning, once again, the phone number and websites are listed. Next. So here's the issue with the access codes. So the ac as I said, in terms of once you've redeemed the access code, it's only good for one person. Um, but you can get additional access codes for 6095 through Jones and Bartlett Learning. Um, and then if there's any problems with that, you contact Jones and Bartlett Tech Support. Uh, and that's really a, a key factor that we understand that sometimes it's hard to have many books. The books are, you know, library, they're shared, but you have to have your own access code. So each student will need that, an access code. Next. I think this is where, uh, in terms of Keith is going to take over. Yep. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Keith. Um, first of all, I just want to say happy EMS week to everybody. You know, um, thank you guys all for taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, remember, what we do out in the field matters. So, you know, thank you guys and uh, keep up the great work. So I'm going to be going ahead and going over how to register as a how to register a course as a course coordinator. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, just for your reference here, if you guys want, you can actually zoom in on the screen. Uh, we can't increase the size anymore, but you can zoom in as we're talking about this. So how do we go ahead and register a course? Remember, um, the, it's recommended that you have everything set up at least 30 days in advance, and you have to determine whether you're going to be doing a on-site or hybrid course. And um, you make the, those decisions as you're going through, and you do the you do your registration at the PEP site, which is www.pepsite.com, and you register through your um, you register the course through the online database by clicking on courses and, rog and rosters after you've gone ahead and logged in with your course coordinator credentials. So you go through, fill out your dates, everything that's going, you know, all the appropriate information here, and enter um, in the required information and hit submit, and you will get a confirmation email. Next slide, please. So um, how does the course coordinator set up a roster? There's a few different components to the roster, and we're going to go through them. But um, when you're setting up your roster, you've got your student component, you've got your instructors, and then you have your medical advisors component. When you're going through, you, you have to identify each person as, they're go, as, you're in, as you're putting the information in manually, and we'll show you that process. But this is really where the, um, the access codes come into play that was mentioned earlier. Everybody has to have an individual access code because that's how you're going to retrieve that information. You're going to be retrieving it based off the email that those people use to register for that course. Next slide, please. So setting up your course roster, um, go ahead and search for students through open, you know, click on the open roster, and um, you accept students into the course through the course registration tab. And again, please feel free to zoom in. Um, if you are on a computer, you can, you'll see a little uh, magnifying glass, and you can increase the percentage on the bottom left-hand corner. So when you're doing this, you, know, you have to ensure that each student has um, the pre-course work done prior to the, um, the course itself. What I generally do is I ask them to print off the certificate of completion um, before they come in. So I ask them to bring that in. Or, you know, sometimes they'll just email me a PDF or things like that, and that's fine. But they have to have that information then. And this is whether they do the on-site or the hybrid. Because um, the on-site has uh, that pretest aspect, but the hybrid also has online modules. And depending on which option you choose, you have to do that. Then you can want to go ahead and communicate to the students um, to select open enrollment in their Jones and Bartlett Learning account to complete their pre-course work. Um, this is something that you do as you are in, as you're enrolling students, uh, whatever your system process is. 
Um, the last uh, classes that I've done, I just did uh, 300 students for Cincinnati Fire Department. We put the entire, uh, all the paramedics through the program. And for there, we went through and um, we told them all that they had to register with their email account for the city. And then we also told them that they had to go through, uh, click on the open enrollment, and we just sent out a, a quick email explaining uh, the registration process. And it was pretty straightforward and everybody was pretty compliant. We didn't really run into any issues. Next slide, please. So setting up the course, um, you have to manually adjust in the drop down um, the whether or not a student passes or fails. Uh, you can go through and click everybody on there. And um, it's not circled in here, but you can also remove students if they don't show up for a class. Like uh, for the classes that I was talking to you about previously, we had uh, 300 students, but we also offered multiple classes. Some students would register for one, but they weren't able to make it, so they had to go to another one. So we just would remove them, and then they would go ahead and enroll them into the other course. Contact any students who have not um, completed their pre-course work and address the issue. Um, it's really, it's, it's a balancing act because you, you really do need to be pretty firm. And we understand that there's technical issues and things like that that happen, but they're not going to get their, um, they're not going to get their card and all this stuff without that pre-course work being done. So it has to be done. Um, the onus is on the students, but um, we do identify that there is some issues and there's some flexibility if needed, you know, but you really want it done before the class, and that is the absolute preference. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so setting up the course roster, uh, going through, um, you see the drop-down bar on the top right, and this is where you're going to pick your um, medical director, uh, your and any assistant instructors or students, and that's where you're going to add your medical director and students. Now remember, this is an important fact for this course is you can only have one medical director for the course. So if you have, if you are in an urban area and you're using any of the um, pediatric emergency medicine fellows, then um, they, if you have more than one uh, physician, the, you've got your medical director and then everybody else will be listed as assistant instructors. So go ahead, and all you need to do is put in the medical director, put in their um, name, their email address, and, um, and just submit it and add the medical director, and it pops right up. Next slide, please. So course completion requirements. Um, again, goes back to which track did they do? Did they do the hybrid or did you do the on-site track? But um, the course requirements will vary slightly depending on the track you chose. Next slide, please. So to complete the, um, for course completion requirements, the complete pre-course work prior to PEP is what you know, needs to be done. Um, the on-site, uh, if you're doing on-site, again, you're just doing the pre-test, but it still needs to be done, and that's what that access code is for. If you're doing a hybrid, then they have to go through all those online modules before they come in. And like I said, if you can get them to print out the uh, certificate of completion, um, when they're finished or if they can email you a PDF, either way. It's not a requirement by PEP, but it does help as a course coordinator to keep everything organized and to have everything set up. So you've got your roster uh, that everybody signed in on, and then you can go ahead and cross-tabulate you know, everybody on the roster versus all the certificates that you have. And it helps. I usually have everything done. Um, I know that I've got everything ready by the end of the course, so when I'm going ahead to submit everything, I know that I have everything I need. Um, obviously participate in the PEP course and all the components of it, and then they have to pass the final examination. Um, students who successfully complete the course taught by the PEP course um, coordinator, they are eligible to um, receive a PEP course completion certificate, and that is valid for two years. Next slide, please. So the course coordinator teaching requirements. Um, individuals who wish to become PEP course coordinators or wish to reactivate their instructor status, um, they have to have, be a physician, registered nurse, pediatric nurse practitioner, PA, um, EMT, or paramedic. But I believe that, um, I know it's an EMT or paramedic. I believe it is EMT, AMT, or paramedic. Um, have EMS teaching experience, and this is um, this has changed slightly. 
that from what it has been in the past. And if any of you guys have taught before, uh, if you guys remember going through the the course coordinator requirements, they used to say that you have to have teaching experience as expressed in you know, being an American Heart Association ACLS instructor, BLS instructor, or an NAMT AMLS or PHTLS instructor, um, they've they have um, made it a lot broader. It's not that you have to be a instructor in another uh, certification course. It's just that you have to have that experience as an instructor as an instructor in EMS. And then they also have to successfully complete the pet provider course at the level for which they wish to conduct the course. And then um, after they do that, they, um, they're going to go ahead and do the course coordinator modules online. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Um, so you go ahead and submit the electronic application to the American Academy of Pediatrics, that's through the PEP website, and then you do your online orientation. And this is slightly different than previous editions, where previous editions you could have an on-site component where um, a course coordinator could go through all the orientation modules and then they could sign off on uh, new course coordinators. Now, any course coordinator, or I'm sorry, any anybody who is interested in becoming a course coordinator has to do the online orientation module. And then they also have to be knowledgeable of the most current PEP course materials and they have to teach at least two courses within two years to maintain their status. Next slide, please. Um, I think is this where we're switching back up again? Uh, Keith, I think you have this last slide, and then it goes to Dr. Oh. Duke. Okay. Um, so a couple of the resources. The PEP site is awesome. Um, there's a ton of information. I highly suggest, you know, if you're sitting around at the station or something, just go ahead and go through it, because there really is a ton of information on that website. And I know, like, if you've watched orientation, you've probably seen like the basic components and things, but there's so much more on there than is really covered in the orientation. And then uh, also, if you guys are on social media, um, the AAP has a fantastic uh, Facebook presence. Follow them. They, they're they awesome. They're always posting uh, pictures from different conferences they're at. Um, when we were doing, when uh, Melissa and I were doing simulations at EMS World last year, all those pictures were posted up online and um, they post uh, interesting and relevant articles. Uh, I just saw some stuff uh, a little while ago off from EMSC. So they're very, very active on, on uh, social media. So please go ahead, like their page, follow them. They do a great job. And then they always, if you have any questions, they're always available by email and phone, and they are the promptest people to get back to you. They are on the money. They are so quick about it. So really, they're always there to help, and they really do a fantastic job. So. Um, I think that's it for me. Next slide, please. Okay, this is Susan again. Um, just to kind of give you a, a brief what's ahead for PEP, we are working on a PEP renewal course. Uh, in terms of things have not been completely finalized, but the idea that, you know, yes, we could do a kind of a shorter uh, renewal course, so that way you can still do some hands-on skills, but uh, it wouldn't have to be necessarily the eight hours. You know, one of the big things that we understand people do want, the C-SPEAM credits, but it's something to think about. We are also going to have a needs assessment survey, and for everybody online and any well, your, anybody who is involved in PEP or APC, this is going to be a survey about what are the gaps in pediatric continuing education. What we'd like to do is really get your input so that we can build new modules. Um, we have some ideas, but we really would, you know, want your ideas about where do you think you need, you know, some additional education, some additional modules, um, where are, you know, where are sort of the gaps so that when you receive this survey, please fill it out, please return it, um, because like I said, without that input, you know, we are just, we're, we obviously have people involved in EMS, but we really want, you know, everybody's input about where should we, you know, do the next kind of module, what should we focus on when we actually do, if we do new chapters or new online uh, scenarios, anything. Um, the other thing is we are working on a new Children with Special Health Care Needs module. You know, I know that's very difficult for a lot of people. There's lots of kids out there with whether it's, it's chronic illnesses, um, technology-assisted children, but that always is a very key area because there's not much out there. 
And we also are developing a library of online modules with the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians. Um, you know, we do understand that they use the PEP text for their EPC module, but in terms of working together to really have uh, online resources for people taking either EPC or PEP so everyone could really do some good sharing. Uh, next slide, I think, is really just some questions for you. That is correct, uh, Dr. Fuchs, and thank you very much, and thank you, um, Keith, as well. We're doing really great on time here, um, so we have plenty of time for questions, and I hope there are many because we have two um, great experts here that can answer just about any content uh, or administration-related question. Um, we were going to handle this over chat. We've got a, a good group of people here, about just over 70 folks on the line. I think that we can open it up. Um, we can unmute the lines, Courtney, for questions as long as everyone is is orderly. They can they can chat their questions to you directly as well. Um, we received uh, one question over chat so far, and uh, that is, um, how many days in advance must a course be registered? Um, Keith, that might be a good one for you. Um, Brian, I just want to mention I am unmuting the line. Um, if someone does not want their line to be uh, unmuted, they can just go ahead and select star six on their phone, which will remute their line for them. Um, but with that said, please uh, go ahead. We, we can go ahead with the question. Sorry. Thank you, Courtney. Okay. Again, if anyone wants to mute their lines, they can just hit star six, and that will um, that will mute your individual line, but hopefully we can have a bit of a dialogue here and open it up um, for the entire group without being too disruptive. Um, okay, again, the first question was, how many days in advance must the course be registered? Absolutely. Um, Brian, thanks for the questions, Keith, again. Um, so the recommendation, if you look in the um, instructor toolkit, is 30 days, and that really is what, what we really shoot for. Um, they you know, may be able to make exceptions, but I definitely wouldn't count on that. So you really want to try and have it in 30 days for your teaching. Um, but the, that's what the recommendation is. Does that answer the question? It does for me, sure. Very good. Okay, uh, the next question we see is if there are um, any plans for updating uh, the videos within the core. Two weeks, you'll have a glitter patch. Brian, I, this is Melissa Marks at the AAP. Um, I manage the PET program, just for everyone on the call. Um, we are in the process of updating the video clips right now. Um, Dr. Fuchs actually assisted us uh, with updating those, so I know they are in the works. Um, and once they are completed, I believe they'll be placed online um, through the website, through the course coordinator only section. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the next question, or maybe more of a suggestion, but I, I think it's valuable, is um, if the online course uh, can become more video-based instead of uh, slide-based, if there's an opportunity to incorporate more video in that. Hi, Brian. It's Melissa. Um, I think I can take that question. We are certainly working on providing um, our audience with some more engaging and interactive um, features, and uh, we are certainly working on some simulation-based uh, features with our new modules, which will be part of the new PEP renewal course. Um, so you certainly will be seeing some new, fresh um, materials coming in the next year. That's great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I don't have any uh, questions in chat in front of me right now, so uh, I would like to open this up for anyone who'd like to um, pose their question uh, over the phone. If you just want to announce your name and where you're from and your question, we'd be happy to take it. Okay, one, one question on the 
Uh, are we, are we are the, um, is everyone expected to purchase new revised third edition manuals um, or will they be provided to existing programs? Brian, can you repeat the question again? Are they asking if, um, if they'd be provided to assisting programs, you said? Uh, if, if they would, if it, um, everyone would be required to purchase the new um, third edition or if they would be provided to existing programs. Um, you know, they, w they will not be provided, um, gratis at least, to existing programs, but if anyone would like to um, speak about whether or not it would be required to roll over immediately if there'd be any sort of grace period, I suppose. Um, might be a way to frame the question. Sure. Um, we certainly don't have a required date as to when um, you should be using the revised third edition, but we're certainly encouraging that you start purchasing the new updated content as of now. Um, as Dr. Fuchs had alluded to, it has all of the new updates from the guidelines um, and kind of the recommendations that we are moving forward with. So um, certainly any new textbooks that need to be purchased, you should just be purchasing the revised third edition from now on. Great, thank you, Melissa. All right, this next one's oh, a uh, few real lines quick, long. This is Keith. Go ahead, Keith. Oh, Brian. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also add um, one of the, I think one of the cooler features with the third, the new revised third edition is it does also come with that ebook, which I think is uh, a big component. I I know a lot of my students have gone to ebooks and just having everything on their iPad, so that's been a big help as well. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to try and read this one as best as possible. Um, in the hypothetical that you're having an on-site course and you set it up as an on-site course, uh, students take the pretest. However, they've signed up for the hybrid course. How can they? Um, how can they go fit once uh, completed? Uh, how can they get the card and certificate? If that makes sense, and if not, I welcome the uh, whoever had asked that. Uh, Pete, maybe if you could chime in and clarify the question, if I didn't uh, ask it properly. Yeah, it's more to do with if they uh, if you're having an on-site course and you've got students that are doing the pretest, but they miss uh, clicked on as far as joining the course. They've clicked on the uh, hybrid versus on-site. Um, this is Keith again. I know that I feel like we ran into that issue with one or two students, and I'm trying to think of exactly what we did. Um, I know it's honestly it's a bigger burden on the students because they end up going through the, it's a redundant material. They they go through the material on online and then they go through it in person as well. But I can't remember exactly what we did. Melissa, do you remember what we did for that? Okay, different. Hi, uh, this is Gina from the AAP. Um, if your student does redeem an access code for the incorrect pre-course work, we can definitely change that for them. They just need to contact the PEP program, and we can do that really quick over the phone. It takes about 30 seconds, um, so we can do that for them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. We are in great hands. Lots of, uh, lots of great support here on the call today. Um, next question is when the PEP renewal course will be available. Melissa, I don't have that date in front of me. Are you able to answer that? Um, it's definitely something that we're working on now. I don't have a, um, a firm date, uh, but certainly I'm anticipating in the next six months that we should have at least the first module and subsequent information about what the renewal course will look like. Um, and that would certainly be coming via an e-blast um, to, to this audience. So um, that would come through the Jones and Bartlett Learning um, email um, that we, we work with them on. And we'd also be posting all of this on our Facebook page as well. Great, thank you. Um, we received an inquiry from uh, Byron, who is currently working in Abu Dhabi, and is wondering if he can do a hybrid course while working uh, in the Middle East. 
Yes, we would as certainly As far as that goes, that. would he... Yeah, would he be able to get back to somewhere that has a live component? Because that's, remember, with the hybrid course, it's, you have the online modules, but you also do have to participate in the live components, which are very skill and scenario based. So if he can get back to somewhere like he's going to be traveling somewhere to a site that has it, then he can take it and he can take the online component anywhere he has a good internet connection. But he has to be able to attend a live course in order to complete it. Okay, thanks. thanks. And another international inquiry. Um, uh, any information about how to teach the course as international faculty? Are there any uh, differences in the domestic and international course administration um, policies in particular? Hi, this is Susan. I don't, in terms of the specific policies, you know, I'm going to let Melissa talk to that because we've done some international courses. The key thing is, you know, who you're training and if there's differences in EMS and making sure that the medical director understands the local, you know, protocols and EMS. Um, you know, there may be some differences in medication. There may be just some differences from the standpoint of what, uh, you know, different people can, can do, whether they're basic, whether they're uh, paramedic. Um, so I think those are the key things that whoever's putting on the course to make sure that they are following local protocols, you know, from their own course. Yes, it's PEP, but we understand that things are different in different parts of the world. That's exactly okay. right, Dr. Fuchs. Thank you. And there's definitely no administrative issues from our end. Uh, certainly, you know, we welcome international uh, groups to, to teach the PEP program. Okay, we received uh, one more question about whether the old edition would be obsolete, um, and I think, Melissa, you already covered that. Uh, it's, it's still available and can be used, but um, with all of the new content, we'd like to get everyone to roll over to the revised third edition uh, as soon as possible. That's correct. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Um, see a recommendation that in the future um, that we try and coordinate with the AHA guideline revision schedule uh, so that the programs uh, don't have to repurchase materials more often than every five years. That's, um, that's good input. This, this is Susan, too. Um, another thing is, you know, we have tried to do that with revisions. Um, obviously, you know, the American Heart Association may, you know, they've thought about potentially changing and they don't do it every five years, that they do it continually. Uh, so obviously we're going to keep abreast of what they do um, and we have tried to, you know, when we come out with a new book and we know something is coming, you know, and if it was five years, whatever, that's why we were really ready to go with this revision because, you know, the minute the new guidelines came out, you know, we understood we needed to change, say, the shock, the cardiovascular uh, and neonatal. but. Hopefully in the future they may not be doing it on that five-year basis, but just on a continual basis. So we will kind of keep abreast of that. Hey, thank you. Um, we've got a strong international contingent on the phone today, which is great. Um, we received another question about becoming a course site in Saudi Arabia, and I think we've already talked a little bit about um, uh, international course setup. Uh, I think a good way to um, for next steps for anyone who has more specific um, administration questions or how to get set up is to uh, simply email the AAP uh, at pep at aap.org with any um, questions around materials or getting set up as a, a new center, whether it's in the U.S. or abroad. They'd be um, happy to help Brian. You. Yep. Brian, this is Pete again. Um, just one other thing, the PEP site, if you go there, that's where the course coordinator module is, and uh, there's a ton of information on there. So um, if you are interested, the PEP site has the course, if you've been through the course already, that's where you would go ahead and get started on that process. Great, thanks, Keith. Um, the next question is, a, I'm not sure if this is, um, correctly, but is there replication of the instructor from PAL to PEP? Is replication the right term? Does that make sense? Oh, hi, this is Susan. Um, 
the issue with PEP is we really don't have a separate instructor course. Um, I am a, a PALS instructor and I just had to renew everything through that. Um, I had to take the class again, I had to do my instructor materials online and in class. We don't have that as an instructor per se per, for PEP. Once again, we said, you know, in terms of when you're an instructor, we rely on the course coordinators to, you know, select instructors who know the material, understand what pre-hospital care um, and PEP, but you don't have a specific instructor course. So that's what's very different. Um, and like I said, that's where the course coordinators are very important, as well as the medical director, that they should understand local protocols, they should understand how to teach, they should understand what you know EMS can and cannot do in their communities. Um, but there's not a specific instructor course. And also I wanted to mention, uh, we do have reciprocity with, uh, with the AHA for PALS that if you are a PALS instructor, you can also be a PEP course coordinator. But it's not vice versa. Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that extends to EPC as well? I believe so, yes. Great. Um, I have no more chat questions in front of me, so again, I would welcome anyone to uh, voice any questions over the phone or get their final uh, questions in. Hi, my name is Rowan. Hi, go ahead. Uh, what is the procedure for uh, reciprocation from PALS to PEP? This is Susan. Right now, they, there's not necessarily, like I said, they don't, you can't get both at the same time. Um, We've worked with American Heart on different things, but that's still, like I said, it's not like they, if you take one, it, it works over to the other. We understand that a lot of the hands-on skills may be similar, but it's not like you can take the hands-on skills in PALS and that would give you credit for PEP. So right now they are two still separate courses. Thank you. And on top of the, on top of the skills aspect, there's also, um, the American Heart Association awards C speech credits for PALS and PEP awards C speech credit for PEP. But those those have to be taken independently in order to get that credit. Okay, any final questions? Okay, I think that's it. Um, we'll let everyone off. Oh, we got one more question. Um, what is the difference between EPC and PEP since EPC is using the PEP textbook right now? That's a good question. As far as there's a significant amount of content difference in the, the way the content is designed, the people on the committee and everything along those lines. The NAMT committee, um, they do a great job. It's uh, all internal NAMT people, and they go through and they develop their content for for their course and the way it's distributed goes through the NAMT and um, everything goes through their um, their process. The PEP course itself, it's uh, designed with a conglomerate of different um, associations. If you saw that list, that was mentioned earlier. I mean, uh, as was mentioned, I'm the I'm on the PEP steering committee as the National Association of EMS Educators representative. We've got a representative from the NEMT, from the National Association of EMS Physicians, and it's it's um, stakeholders throughout the industry who help develop this content. And when we go through and we develop and, and all of the content, it goes through a massive review process and um, before it gets disseminated. I don't, I don't know if one course is better than the other. It's just it's different content. Uh, they're all built on the same processes and everything. If you look the Pediatric Life Support Collaborative that was mentioned earlier, that's something that actually compares the different courses. We talk about some of the different terminology, but the goal of that process was to actually unify that terminology to make it across all the sections that we're talking the same language. So 
personally, as an educator, when I was a training officer before I came to uh, University of Cincinnati, I like to have options that way I because I wanted regular pediatric education, and for PEP, it's a two-year cycle. So I like to have different options so that my, my providers were getting pediatric education at a minimum on an annual basis. But that's just my preference. There's no, it's not the same exact material, there's different scenarios, but it's the same topics that are being discussed. Would uh, those, the other subject matters on the phone agree? Is that a fair assessment? Yes, absolutely, Keith. Thank you. Okay, the chat is clear. Um, I guess we can leave it at that. Uh, as a reminder, we will send out a copy of these slides and recording um, likely tomorrow to everyone who's been able to join us. Um, we certainly do appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Fuchs, Mr. Widmeyer, everyone at the AAP, including Melissa, um, your help and assistance and time is greatly appreciated. Uh, I hope it's been worth everyone's while. I'm just going to go back um, two slides quickly before we call it a wrap and reinforce um, some resources that you all can uh, check out. Um, by all means, please visit the pepsite.com. Um, you can also email pep at aap.org. Um, you've got the AAP life support um, phone number here as well, and I uh, should go check them out on facebook.com at uh, aap.tep. Um, with that, we will call it a wrap. Once again, thank you for all of your time, uh, and let us know if we can answer any questions or get you help uh, uh, set up with any materials or as a training center um, or anything we can, else, uh, we can do to help you get aboard with PEP. Thanks once again, and have a great day. Happy EMS week, everybody. Yeah, happy EMS week.